Well, as we come to this passage in God's Word this morning, let's ask his help to understand it and to uh, respond in faith and obedience. Father, we thank you for your Word. Uh, Everything we have in Scripture is breathed out by you through human authors, but they recorded uh, in uh, the freedom that you gave them, the very things that you would have them say. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we, as we come to this passage this morning, uh, we recognise it is you speaking to us into our situation. Uh, we pray that, uh, Lord, we would hear what it says, but more than that, we would take it to heart, we would have understanding, uh, so that we know uh, how to respond in obedience. Uh, Lord, uh, give us the desire to not only know your word, but to live it out day by day. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think it's just me. I think you probably share this opinion as well, that scams are everywhere. They, they seem to be proliferating. They're, they're coming to us in plague proportions. Uh, you probably know someone who has been scammed uh, or just narrowly escaped being scammed. Perhaps you've just narrowly escaped yourself. Uh, some days I get multiple text messages from someone or different people trying to scam me. In fact, I've got one this morning. Uh, there are messages that say, um, click on this link. There's a supposed delivery from DHL. There's an issue. Click on this link. Or... or Texts that tell me that I have a, a message um, and there's this really peculiar URL and it says, you know, click this link to get your message. Sure. Um, then there are other kinds of scams. Uh, someone we know was caught in a Netflix scam. Uh, it came at a time when there was some confusion about the account. It seemed to be genuine. Uh, the situation uh, ended up with money being defrauded from their bank account. Friends, that's what happens when we're not wary. It's a sad situation, isn't it? That, that in this world, we almost have to treat everything as being suspect. Because when we don't, when we trust the voice that we don't know, that spins a good story and sounds reasonable, we're at risk. It's a trap that we can so easily fall into, particularly if we're busy or distracted uh, and we don't verify the credentials. Friends, if you get caught in a Netflix or a DHL scam, it may cost you some money. But that's all it will cost you. But how much more costly and how permanent it is to get scammed by false teachers when it comes to the matters of eternity. Peter is very conscious of this danger. You see, scams are not anything new. There were plenty of them in the first century. Uh, and he was very aware of the dangers they present. In fact, the first century was not the introduction of these things. We, we read the Old Testament. We find that there were false prophets who led people away from the Lord while pretending to speak for him. 
And, and Peter knows uh, that this is happening in the New Testament church. Peter and the other apostles themselves are, are criticised uh, and opposed by those who present themselves as more enlightened teachers. Well, Peter's own execution is just around the corner as he writes this letter. He knows he's going to die. And so in his love, in his great love for these believers, wanting to see them secure at the end with Christ in heaven, he gives them a solemn warning. Peter says to them in, at the end of chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 2, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. You see, Peter is saying it's not a matter of if it happens, it's a matter of when it happens. They will come. They will not only come from the outside, they will arise from within your own ranks. Peter's words perhaps echo the, the words of Paul to the Ephesian elders um, when he said to them, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Be alert. Are you alert? Friends, I, I, I want to ask you this morning and, and ask you very seriously and very solemnly, which voices are you listening to? Who are you listening to? with all the deceptive voices out there ready to speak things to us that we will like to hear, how critical it is for us, who, for us who claim to belong to Christ to return to God's word to see what he says to us. Uh, the psalmist wrote, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Peter has said in chapter 1 that God's word is a lamp shining in a dark place. And Paul tells us that every word from God's breath is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness so that we will be complete, equipped for every good work. And friends, it is as we have familiarity with the true word, what God says in his word, that we are less likely to fall for what is untrue, to fall for the scam. So what voices are you listening to? Are you absorbing what God has to say so that you are ready to identify the voices that are not true? The Lord said through Jeremiah, Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them. Who are the false teachers? Where do they come from? How can we identify them? 
Well, friends, falsehood has many faces uh, and it comes from different places. The names of spiritual scammers can be found on the covers of books uh, in your local bookstore. Uh, Spiritual scammers have blog pages. You can find them on your TV screen uh, and you can find them in pulpits. They come as gurus, as spiritual guides, as faith healers, but then they come as televangelists and prosperity gospel preachers. Um, Then there is Oprah, who promotes her own brand of religion based on Eastern mysticism, Hinduism and paganism. But friends, the false teachers aren't just outside the walls of the church. Peter warned against those, he says in verse 1, who are among you. They are among you. They are native even to evangelical churches. It's not just those out there in other circles. It's not just those other churches that are of a different type down the road. Peter says they're among you. They include ordinary preachers who get up in ordinary churches um, and perhaps even in very subtle ways call people to living a good life rather than calling them to repentance. They include those who promote relevance over righteousness. They are those who turn Jesus into some convenient way of getting what we want. And generally, they make you the hero of your own spiritual story. They are those who, who come along and their focus is on outward conformity rather than inward change. These false teachers are the elder or the pastor whose faith in Christ has not been internalised first and lived out in genuine experience before they pretend to speak for him. You see, true faith in Christ is not something we wear like a garment. It's something that goes to the very core of our beings and transforms us. How can you know them? Well, well, Peter gives us some help in, in identifying false voices from, from true voices. And he tells us, firstly, you can identify them by their words. You can tell who they are by what they say. Peter says they distort the truth and deny Jesus. In verse 1 he says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even Denying the master who bought them. You see there? Destructive heresies. Denying Jesus. And they bring upon themselves swift destruction. And we remember that it is not just what they say, but what they don't say that makes them false teachers. They are not willing to submit themselves to God's word. They, they, uh, 
they put themselves over God's word. They sit in judgment on it, declaring what is right and what is wrong, rather than humbling themselves under it. Peter says in verse 12, they are blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, which also, and they will also be destroyed in their destruction. You see, ultimately, false teachers point people away from the real Jesus and they cause people to trust in something else or, or, or in a Jesus of their own imagination. When Paul went to Berea and preached the good news amongst uh, the Jews who he found in, in that town, we read... Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You see, they, they went back and they tested what Paul had to say against the word of God to see whether Paul was a, a, a true apostle or a false teacher. How do you know someone is telling the truth or spiritually scamming you? Well, see how what they say measures up against what is perfectly true, what is recorded in Scripture uh, as God's Word breathed out to us without error. Peter says in chapter 1 and verse 21, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John urges us, brother, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, and they still do. The second thing Peter says is that we can tell false teachers, spiritual scammers, not only by their words, but by their lives. He says we can tell it by their actions because like Balaam in the Old Testament, all that they have done is to add a, rich, a religious veneer to their sinful lifestyles. And in addition to their heresies, there is a denial of Jesus, you see, in the way they live. So we read in verse 10... They, they indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. God's word is not right here. We know better. That was, that was written to the circumstances of the time. Our times are different. Our culture is different. Or... or or they twist things to satisfy their own desires. They indulge, he says, in the lust of defiling passion. They despise authority. In verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, and friends, don't we still see that today in the tragic fall of pastors from grace and from their ministries? You see, error in the word leads to error in conduct. Why? Well, simply because, you see, 
what is spoken, the word expresses what is in the heart. What is done by the hands expresses what is in the heart. Their hearts are ruled by self-indulgence that bends other people to serve their own greedy desires. Friends, are you careful about the voices you trust? Uh, about the people you listen to? Measure their words against the word of God. And if it doesn't seem to stack up, then let me say to you, you are most likely in great danger. Flee from that. Peter warns, you are being scammed. You are being scammed. Why is Peter so concerned about spiritual scammers? What's so terrible about them after all? Well, it's terrible because eternity is at stake. It's terrible because scams work. We're, we're susceptible, aren't we? We hear something that appeals to us, we're, we're all too ready to believe it. Uh, we are too easily taken in. Uh, and, and when we're taken in, we suffer loss. And so Peter says in verse 2, uh, and many will follow their sensuality because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. Many will follow their sensuality. Uh, you know, Peter doesn't assume False teachers don't have a following. They do. They appeal. We respond. Scammers take for themselves and they leave you poorer. And false teachers do the same. Peter says in verse 17, he characterizes it this way. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Friends, where God's grace is experienced, the Bible often expresses it in the language of being well watered uh, because, you know, we as human beings and, and plants as well need water. It's one of the necessities of life. Uh, we might recall that Jesus used the image of water to speak of the new life that he offered. He said to the Samaritan woman at the well, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But friends, there is no life-giving moisture in the offerings of these false teachers. Peter describes them as waterless springs and mists driven by the storm. David Helm says they lowered their buckets into the wellspring of their own self-delusion and pulled it back up in the presence of the people and when they poured it out before God's thirsty flock, nothing except dry, gritty sand fell uselessly to the ground. No true refreshment and no soul satisfaction or invigorating relationship with God. You see, Peter says they are nothing more than a, a, a passing haze, mist in the air that leaves the ground just as parched as it was before it came. But even worse than that, 
you see, they have drawn the attention of God's people away from the true source of life in Jesus Christ. They, they have promised pr freedom, Peter says in verse 19. But of course, they can't give anything more than they have for themselves. And Peter says they are slaves of corruption. And so those who listen to their voices, who follow their ways, they make also in the slaves of corruption. You see, the people Peter warned about were those coming from within the community of the church. They, Peter says that their last state, verse 20, has become worse for them than the first. That's just not the false teachers. It's, it's those who are listened to them as well. He says in verse 21, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. They have... a sense of the gospel. They have tasted the way of righteousness. They know the way of righteousness, Peter says in verse 21, in the sense that they know the gospel. They've heard the gospel. And they've tasted the grace it brings by being part of a church community. But all the while, despite outward appearances, they have never experienced that grace for themselves in new life. It's never been internalized. It's just been put on as an outward garment. It hasn't gone into their soul, into their hearts through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. The seed of the Word of God has not taken root and the weeds of the old life have grown up and choked out any hope of life in Christ and it becomes clear that ultimately, all along, they have been ruled by their own sinful desires. As Peter puts it so eloquently in verse 22, as he quotes uh, the proverb, the dog returns to its vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow, in the mire. And Peter concludes that for them and for those who listen to them, the last day has become worse than the first. It would have been better for them to have never known the righteousness, the way of righteousness, than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. You see, when it comes to judgment, we're not only judged by what we have done, we're judged on the basis, too, of what we have known and turned our backs upon, what we have rejected. How careful we need to be that we listen to the right voices. And ultimately you know who the true voices are because they love God's word and they make much of Jesus. He is everything to them. 
And they make much of him, not just with their words, but also with their lives. So what does Peter want us to do? Well, Peter wants us to be discerning. He wants us to be on our guard. He wants us not to fall for false teaching. He's also concerned, though, that we not get discouraged by the state of things that we see around us. That we don't fall apart when we realise that perhaps even in in our own church there are those who speak things that are false. Peter doesn't want us to be surprised and he doesn't want us to be discouraged even when we see spiritual scammers seeming to win the day. The main thing that Peter wants us to grasp is is this, he says in verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Who's the Lord here? We should understand Peter is speaking about Jesus. He describes him in verse 1 as the master who bought them. Uh, In verse 20, he speaks of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Um, Who's the one who knows how to rescue and how to judge? It's Jesus. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the referee who knows how to deal with every circumstance. There's, there's a difference between Aussie Rules football and rugby union. Um, there's a few differences, actually. <laughs> but what I'm thinking of is this. In, in Aussie Rules, you know, when there's an infringement, the umpire blows the whistle, um, he, he stops the game, and he makes a decision on the spot. In rugby union, the referee can wave the play on after an infringement. And it might be quite some time later, after the ball is no longer in play, that that the referee goes back to where the infringement took place and addresses the, the player concerned. Although there's a, a delay for the sake of the flow of the game. Justice is done. And it's the same when it comes to Jesus. Peter Peter wants us to have confidence that Jesus knows both how to keep the unrighteous for punishment and to rescue the godly. Uh, The people in Noah's day went on living how they wanted despite Noah's preaching. Uh, They felt comfortable and and you can imagine them gathering around um, and making fun of Noah, laughing at him, mocking his message uh, as they feel sure day after day nothing changes so no judgment is going to come. But then it did. And the Lord rescued Noah and those with him. Uh, In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah plummeted into the depths of sexual depravity. The inhabitants were were all too ready to rape and abuse strangers under the cover of darkness, uh, as though it was some kind of game that they played. And you can imagine the distress of Lot living there in the midst of these events, Day after day, Peter says that his soul was tormented constantly by what he saw and what he heard. But judgment came. And Lot and his family were delivered. Friends, whatever the state of the visible church, even as many... Churches 
perhaps care more about um, stars in their Google rating than they do about the opinion of Jesus. Peter wants us to remember that Jesus has it all in hand. He knows what to do. Jesus knows what to do. Jesus knows how to rescue. Jesus knows how to bring judgment. Noah's and Lot's experience was that Jesus knows how to rescue them. It was Peter's experience too, after his denial of Jesus, probably when he thought his any hope of serving Jesus was all over, Jesus came and restored him. He said, Simon Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. You see, Jesus is full of grace. And, and he knows how to rescue and to keep those who are his. But he also knows how to judge. And, and so we can have that confidence that sin and deceit and false teaching and shameful falls from grace in the church, uh, that, that infighting that we find, that the, the public deconversions of prominent Christian figures, they don't have the final word. Jesus does, and Jesus knows what to do, and he will do it. Friends, is that your confidence too? Paul says, he more than says, he commands, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Don't be anxious. Uh, and in the earlier letter, Peter wrote to these very same Christians, he said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I can imagine that's what Noah did. That's what Lot did. Friends, scams abound. The worst kind of spiritual scams are perpetrated not only in online or by text message or by a phone call, but they're, they're perpetrated where it should be safe, in the Christian church. And the worst kind of scams do not involve your Netflix account where they can only rob you of your money. They are spiritual scams where what is at stake is of eternal value. Friends, have you believed a lie? Have you believed a lie? Have you mixed other things in with faith in Jesus so that what you end up with is something distorted and twisted and false? Come in repentance, ask forgiveness. Ask God to show you the truth through his word. Friends, be certain that your eternal hope is based on what God says and nothing else. Nothing else. And if you say your hope is in Jesus, make sure that the the Jesus you claim to have hope in is the Jesus of Scripture. And, and if you claim to have hope in the Jesus of Scripture, make sure that when you have come to him, you have come to him on the terms that he has laid down, not on the terms that you have laid down. And friends, if you are unsure, if you don't know the voices that you have trusted are true, then I say to you, let us sit down. 
and look at God's word together and work it out. Let's see what is true. Friends, ask God to show you whether your hope rests on solid ground because he will never lie to you. He will never scam you. He will never deceive you. His heart is to draw you to himself that you may have your hope resting in Jesus. And his heart is to give you the assurance that you belong to him, that you are held secure, that heaven is not just kept for you, but you are being actively kept for your inheritance there by his power, that you will be with him forever and ever. Friends, scams abound. The worst kind are the scams that will rob you of Christ in eternity. Be sure what voices you are listening to. Let's pray. Father, there are many voices in this world. Conflicting voices, voices that demand our attention, voices that play on our desires to lure us by what we want rather than what is true. And behind those voices is Satan, who is the father of lies, the deceiver. And he will twist and distort God's word. He, he will say to you, uh, to us, did God really say? Father, help us to discern the spirits, to discern what is true and what is not by going back to your word and seeing whether what is said measures up and Lord, help us to be careful who we listen to. Exercising discernment by looking at their words and looking at their lives. And Father, lead us into all truth in Jesus Christ. May you give us the certainty that our lives, our, our hope for eternity is on a firm foundation because it rests in and trusts in the person and work of the Jesus of Scripture who made us, who came to save us and is coming back again. He is the one who knows how to rescue and knows how to judge. Lord, when he comes, may we be found in him. Give us that certain hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.